All right, so Matt, do you know the difference between toilet paper and a shower curtain? Um, no. I, well, oh, so you're the one. <laughs> <laughs> I knew where you were going. (laughs) Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam. And my name's Matt. Now. Pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable because this is Graveyard Tales. <laughs> All right, everybody. Here we are again. Um, Matt, how you doing tonight, brother? I'm good. I can't get my chair right. Oh, didn't mean to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that's give a beep for... Give me something to bleep right there. Yeah, right. <laughs> Matt, put your show feel, voice on. Show filter. I, I feel like I'm either sitting too close or too far away tonight. <laughs> I don't know what the deal is. Uh, I'm Actually, I'm I'm doing pretty good, you know. It's been a little crazy, but uh, it's good to be back in the graveyard. Yep, yep. The I get a little normalcy back in our life with uh, the graveyard here, so... Um, real quick, we want to thank tonight's sponsor, Every Plate. Um, we'll talk about them a little bit more later, but now is a good time to check out Every Plate. Um, also, uh, check out podbelly.com. They've got stuff on how to start your own podcast, the stuff that you might need to buy to start your own podcast, and they've got a whole bunch of other podcasts to listen to that you may not find normally. They've got it all compiled there. Um, and we're proud to be members of the Podbelly Network. So go check them out at podbelly.com. Um, while you're on the internet, if you don't mind, give us a review on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to us. It really helps us out. Just write something in there because for some reason, the text that you write helps more than just the little five star click. So if you don't mind, give us a review, say a little something, and share us. Tell people about the graveyard. Now is a good time to get into the graveyard and to spread the news about the graveyard. So uh, let somebody know about it. And while you're sitting around the house at night, you can listen to Graveyard Tales. So without much further ado, Matt, why don't you tell us, what are we talking about tonight, brother? Okay, so tonight, Adam and I are digging into one of the most well-known cryptid legends on the East Coast. You know, it's not uncommon for regions to celebrate their cryptid history, and New Jersey is no exception. Books, movies, documentaries, TV shows, video games, and so much more portray the beast of the Pine Barrens. I mean, hell, they named their hockey team after it. Yep, so exactly. Adam, Adam, let's get into our discussion on the famous Jersey Devil. All right. Now, we have touched on the Jersey Devil in a previous episode, but we didn't go real deep into the legend or sightings or anything like that. So we're going to do that tonight. Um. As kind of, and, and I know a lot of y'all have probably heard about the Jersey Devil, but if you haven't, this will be a good introduction for you. And if you have, maybe we'll throw some new stuff out there for you that you haven't heard. Um, but we got to talk about the Pine Barrens where the Jersey Devil supposedly lives first in order to kind of get an idea of that area. Um, the Pine Barrens is there's a 1.1 million acre Pinelands Natural Reserve that stretches south and west from Ocean County and makes up 22% of New Jersey's total land mass. So that is a big natural reserve. That's 22%. Yeah, I mean, New Jersey is the garden state. Right. It it should it should be the pine forest state. <laughs> yeah, no joke. 
<laughs> the Pine I mean, Barren huge. State. It is. It's 1.1 million acres. It's crazy. Um, well, created by Congress in 1978, the reserve was designated an International Biosphere Reserve in 1988. Um, it's bigger than either Yosemite or the Grand Canyon National Park. It's big. Wow. Yeah. Now, European settlers... You know what's funny? Huh. Is un- until I really started digging into paranormal stuff, I had no idea what the Pine Barrens were. Oh, really? Yeah, that ought to tell you something. I mean, I'm not from New Jersey, and I've got two friends that are from New Jersey, and they don't discuss it. So, <laughs> I was like, yeah. it's funny. It comes up so much when you're talking about, you know, weird, strange, cryptid, whatever, we're talking about the Northeast. Right. You know, the Pine, the Pine Barrens comes up. And, you know, that, that, ought to, that ought to give you a clue right there. <laughs> yeah, right. And, 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 you know, you're right. It is kind of a hidden thing. If you're not into Fortiana or cryptozoology or anything paranormal, you don't really know about it unless you grew up around there. It's kind of interesting. Um, well, when the European settlers first moved into that air, area, they found that the sandy, acidic soil was really unsuited for farming. Um, and so they really didn't do anything with the land. They left it untouched from the time they got there, but apparently beneath the pines lies a natural reserve of bacterially sterile, chemically pure water that the U S geological survey has compared to quote, uncontaminated rainwater or melted glacial ice. So this water is tinted like tea from tannins from cedar trees and iron from the ground. And it was once prized by sea captains to take on voyages because it stayed potable longer than any other water. So, Mm, yeah, no bacteria in it. Right, right. And it uh, apparently the tannins and stuff in there helped keep it from growing any more bacteria. So it's pretty cool that that's hidden down there. Well, now, early Pineys, as barren residents call themselves, and, and Pineys was actually, it, it kind of started out as a, um, like a diss or a put down, um, kind of like redneck, you know, it, yeah. it started yeah. out as kind of somebody making fun of them, all the Pineys, you know, but now that they, they wear it kind of as a badge of honor as, you know, rednecks do now, you know, so it's kind of interesting <laughs> how... That just, was taken over, you know. Just to clarify, if if you live in the Pied Barrens, Adam and I are not calling you rednecks. <laughs> no, no. Making a comparison in the terms. Some, yeah. Somebody a long time ago made that comparison. <laughs> not right. us. We're well, just we're just stating something. <laughs> and I don't have much room get, to talk we're about emails. Yeah, I don't have much room to talk about being a redneck anyway. I you know. Right, yeah, Adam and I are redneck as hell, so. Yeah, we have our redneck tendencies, so. <laughs> uh, but early pineys um, included Quakers who'd been expelled from their meetings for fighting in the revolution. Outlaws and smugglers um, and Tory loyalists known as the refugees who, despite their politics, rode in packs and killed and robbed indiscriminately. So there was... You know, so people that had been shunned from their social groups at the time went into the barrens to live and, and kind of eke out a living there. Um, eventually, the barrens became home to several industries over the course of its history, including charcoal making. Glass making, um, and believe it or not, the first mason jar was actually made there in the Pine Barrens. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, And wood cutting and cabinetry were all different industries that popped up in the Pine Barrens. Now, Benjamin Randolph, uh, a cabinet maker in Speedwell, crafted the writing desk at which Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. So from that area came that desk. Now, in the late 1800s, Joseph Wharton, the industrialist 
for whom Penn's Wharton School is named. And if you're from that area, you'll know Penn's Wharton School. Um, he acquired 100,000 acres of Pine Barrens land, and he planned to transport the water that was there via canals to a vast reservoir in Camden, uh, then run it beneath the Delaware River into Philadelphia. He wanted to replace the city's foul drinking water with this pristine water from the Barrens. But the New Jersey legislature told him no and prohibited the export of that water. So his land now makes up the Wharton State Forest. I don't know about uh, convincing somebody that this brown water is going to be pristine. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I get that it yeah, is. Yeah, right. <laughs> be a hard sell <laughs> oh yeah yeah it would no 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 it, it's not doo-doo water i promise it's not doo-doo water that's good for you that's good for you <laughs> tastes like hot dog water <laughs> it is <laughs> hot dog water <laughs> <laughs> Now, in the Barrens, uh, even though there is all that water underneath the trees and everything, uh, fire is still a constant threat in the Barrens. Um, in July 1954, in the middle of a drought, what became known as Chatsworth Fire started in a cedar swamp and it burned 19,500 acres. That is a lot of acres. Even though you got 1.1 million, that's, uh, that's 19,000 is a lot of acres. Um, in 1965, a policeman in the Barrens set 69 fires himself and called them all in on his police radio. Now, after his arrest, he was unable to explain why he'd done it. I know why so, he did it. Why is that? He's, he's a pyro. Yep. <laughs> why, yep. Why else would you do that? Right. You just want attention. One. One will get you attention. <laughs> 69 you're just showing out <laughs> right yeah i mean it, it's kind of I, I don't understand why anybody would set fire to a natural area but whatever i'm not a pyro i don't get it yeah yeah this is crazy but now as we talked before the soil of the pine barrens is considered infertile when compared to soils that are to the west and the north um, Pine Barrens upland soil is sandy, sometimes gravelly, um, very acidic and porous, and it doesn't retain enough moisture for most crops to actually live there. Um, only in the fringe areas of the Pine Barrens, what they call the shatter belt, um, is the soil naturally suitable for traditional farming. Um, so in the shatter belt area, they're able to commercially farm vegetables, grain, and fruit. Um, and for them to actually do well there. But cranberry and blueberry farming is different um, because they, you know, those, those plants are naturally adapted to conditions like that in the Pine Barrens. So they've actually taken advantage of it. And the commercial cultivation and harvesting of cranberries and blueberries has thrived in the Pine Barrens for a long time. Um, and it's an important part of the the regions past and present culture having these cranberry and blueberry fields there the cranberry is actually a native north american plant that grows wild in a lot of low fields and meadows um, and native americans use the cranberries as food and for medicinal purposes so it, it's grown there for a while and and it's been used there for a while um and even early european settlers the cranberries were cultivated in Massachusetts around 1820 and in New Jersey sometime between 1825 and 1840. So it's been around for a long time in that area. So real quick, before we get into the devil um, or the Jersey devil, let's take a <laughs> quick look um, at a timeline of the Barons. just so as we're going through dates and times here and talking about sightings in these times you'll kind of know what is happening um, around that time well 10,000 years ago uh, was the end of the last ice age um, and the present plant and animal population actually begin to develop in that area um, and that's when 
the earliest Native Americans are said to have appeared in the area of the Pine Barrens was about 10,000 years ago. Um, in 1624, the exploration of the coastal inlet and bays was first reported. In 1674, earliest permanent European settlers occupy that area, um, just north of present Burlington County line. Now, from 1700 to 1760, many of the hamlets in the coastal towns were settled based on shipbuilding, commerce, and timber-based trades. So that between the 1700 and 1760, it grew tremendously because of shipbuilding. That's They were getting timber and they were building ships for wars and, and wealthy people. You want a ship, you get it from the Pine Barren area there. Just, just making sure you were saying ship. Every time. <laughs> <laughs> yep, ship. <laughs> um, I, I have I have my uh, my internal show filter actually turned on this time. Sometimes I don't, but unlike me, yeah, <laughs> uh, yours turned on. It was just slow to boot up. It was so. slow. <laughs> now uh, in. 1700 up to present day, transportation networks, roads, railroads, and everything were built through the Pine Lands. Um, U.S. Route 9, or the Shore Road, is a historic road that runs along the coast in what is now the Pine Lands National Reserve. 1758, Brotherton Reservation, the county's first Indian reservation, is established. Um, 1760 to 1860, Iron, charcoal, and glass industries pop up and start flourishing. That's when those uh, those industries become big. Now, 1830, uh, the New Jersey Census lists 655 sawmills in the state. Today, there are only about 75 sawmills in the state. So there was a ton of them back then. But mm -hmm. they're you know now they're not allowing them to cut down trees in the barrens. So yeah. back then yeah, they could. Other materials to uh, to compete with, not everything has to be made of wood, right? So that that cut that cuts it back a little bit too. Um, but yeah, you know it's good that you know they're preserving something like this. I mean, you know we don't want to just <laughs> mow it down like <laughs> right. we seem to be so we seem to be so good at other places. Yeah, no joke. All right, so let's talk. Let's get into talking about the Jersey Devil a little bit. And the Jersey Devil was designated in 1938 as the country's only state demon. The state demon, I yeah. love it. So, uh, <laughs> 1938, it became officially the only state demon. Well, you know, at, at least uh, you know the state animal of Tennessee is the raccoon, or you know, trash panda, as some people call them. <laughs> right. Um, you know, that, that it, at least they didn't just make it the official state animal as the Jersey Devil. They, yeah, right. They gave it its proper designation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Jersey Devil is described as a, quote, kangaroo-like creature with the face of a horse, the head of a dog, bat-like wings, horns, and a tail. Um, now, for more than 250 years, this creature is said to prowl the marshes of southern New Jersey and emerge periodically to rampage through the towns and cities. So it's described as, as like this anywhere from three foot to 11 foot long creature that's got alligator skin. Apparently, it has head like a horse, a ram or a dog with horns. And you know, keep all keep this in mind too that it some of these descriptions are going to like contradict one another, like we had with some of the lake monsters and stuff. You know, some people yeah. describe it as one thing, others describe it as another. So it's you get differing opinions, but this yeah. is what most people say. Yeah, the wings are are pretty consistent. Yeah. Um and and the the overall the body shape, the hooves, you know, bipedal. Yep. You know, those are pretty consistent, but 
everything from the the head, the shape of the head, um, you know, the the color, and you know, you, you know, some it's covered in hair, others it's mm-hmm. more scaly, you know, yeah. So they they range um, all over the map as far as that goes, right? Um, because and like Matt said, two of the things that always kind of stick are the small front legs with paw-like appendages and then cloven hooves on its lower appendages. Now, yeah. they say that at night it will emit a loud cry like a squawk or a whistle. Some have even said like a moo or a screech. So apparently it can speak a lot of different animal languages. Squawk, whistle, moo, like screech. It's like a barnyard seeing say. <laughs> right. <laughs> The Jersey Devil says, <laughs> <laughs> "Now some That's say what we need we need that we need a cryptid C and say. You remember what a C and say is? Oh yeah, oh yeah. You you turn the dial to the picture of the animal, and then you pull the string, and it plays the little recording of the of of the thing. I always thought there the way it spun, I thought, well there's a vinyl record in there that's playing yeah. <laughs> this. But but yeah, imagine that. You know, we put the Jersey Devil on there. We could put, you know, Bigfoot on there. That would be great. <laughs> that would be great. Now we need to trademark that or somebody's gonna take our idea. So that's right. Cryptid C and say T M. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Now, some say that the Jersey Devil actually spews flames from its mouth um, and that it emits a foul smell and kills livestock. Now, I think, you know, a lot of people see something like that. They're going to say it can spit flames even if they didn't see it spit flames. Well, it is kind of dragony looking. Yeah, and yeah, I, it is. I've, I've even had, I've even heard it. It compared to a a wyvern, um, which is a dragon. We talked about. Yeah, that's a good uh, comparison. Yeah, we we talked about that in uh, back in our dragon episode. But but yeah, it does because of the short front legs. I like to think of it as like a a, a baby T Rex with wings. Yeah, you know, exactly. That's what, kind of exactly. what it looks like. Now, how do we know the T Rex didn't actually have wings? It could have. Well, yeah. I mean, hey, I've. I, and I've I've been listening to a show that we uh, we just recently promoted. That's all about this one particular episode is all about dinosaurs and what what is and isn't a dinosaur. Anyway, mm-hmm. I'm getting off topic. But when you said T Rex, I was like, Yeah, dinosaurs. I know all kinds of stuff about dinosaurs now. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I didn't learn it from watching the Jurassic Park movies. So, <laughs> right, they, they're not completely accurate. Those movies, they're fun, but they're not completely accurate. Right. <laughs> um, All right. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, the tracks later, but the tracks apparently are about three inches long by two inches wide, and they're said to look like horse hooves, like horse tracks. And some people have even said the horse print looks like it has shoes on it like so it's got horseshoes on the print from not sneakers matt like horseshoes like like, what it's not wearing no it's a horse yeah it's not wearing chuck (laughs) taylor's out there in the forest they mean like but but that now it's in my head (laughs) Baby T Rex with wigs were at Chuck Taylor's. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> this is your Jersey Devil. <laughs> yeah. People yeah. Are from New Jersey are going, I hate these guys. Yeah, right. These <laughs> jerks. Uh, but I mean, that even brings up a thing is out in the forest, if this is a cryptid and it's a, a hooved cryptid how is it being shooed how is it getting horseshoes right. put on its cloven hooves unless it's doing it itself or unless it has taken a farrier captive to shoe it every <laughs> month or something you know i just it's, i don't understand how it it can have horseshoes it's got a slave 
that it's got it's making its shoes and putting them on him. I'm like, right. Wait, wait. Right. I I just got if it looks like a horse track that's got horseshoes, wouldn't you think it's a horse? I yep. mean it's Yep, that, that's my that, guess first. It's it's somebody's horse, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's not it's a wild not a horse. Wild horse. <laughs> <laughs> they don't wear shoes either. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So show show me a wild horse with shoes on. I'm going to show you a dude with a hoof print right square in his forehead. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> show me a uh, show me a wild horse with horseshoes on. I'll show you a Jersey Devil wearing horseshoes. <laughs> All right. So. The Jersey Devil, there is a legend that starts the whole folklore about the Jersey Devil. And there's honestly more than one. But I got one here that I'm going to read before we get into the sightings. Legend has it that in 1735, a Pines resident known as Mother Leeds found herself pregnant for the 13th time. Mother Leeds was not living a wealthy lifestyle by any means. Her husband was a drunkard who made few efforts to provide for his wife and 12 children. Reaching the point of absolute exasperation upon learning of her 13th child, she raised her hands to the heavens and proclaimed, Let this one be a devil! Mother Leeds, (laughs) you're welcome. Mother Leeds went into labor a few months later on a tumultuously stormy night. No longer mindful of the curse she had uttered previously regarding her unborn child. Her children and husband huddled together in one room of their Leeds Point home while local midwives gathered to deliver the baby in another. By all accounts, the birth went routinely and the 13th Leeds child was a seemingly normal baby boy. Within minutes, however, Mother Leeds' unholy wish of months before began to come to fruition. The baby started to change and metamorph right before her very eyes. Within moments, it transformed from a beautiful newborn baby into a hideous creature unlike anything the world had ever seen. The wailing infant began growing at an incredible rate. It sprouted horns from the top of its head, and talon-like claws tore through the tips of its fingers. Leathery, bat-like wings unfurled from its back, and hair and feathers sprouted all over the child's body. Its eyes began glowing bright red as they grew larger in the monstrous in the monster's gnarled and snarling face. The creature savagely attacked its own mother, killing her, then turned its attention to the rest of the horrified onlookers who witnessed its tempestuous transformation. It flew at them, clawing and biting, voicing unearthly shrieks the entire time. It tore the midwives limb from limb, maiming some and killing others. The monsters then knocked down the door to the next room where its own father and siblings cowered in fear and attacked them all, killing as many as it could. Those who survived to tell the tale then watched in horror as the rotten beast sprinted to the chimney and flew up it, destroying it on the way and leaving a pile of rubble in its wake. The creature then made good its escape into the darkness and desolation of the Pine Barrens, where it has lived ever since. To this day, the creature, known varyingly as the Leeds Devil and the Jersey Devil, claims the Pines as its own and terrorizes any who are unfortunate enough to encounter it. It's a good legend. It is. I I, I like the... I, I, it, it just... The legend is is not one of those that is very sparse in detail where, you, you, you know, you get some that are like, Oh, well, this happened, and then, and then this happened, and there you go. This one has, I mean, this one is full of detail, and it explains exactly where it came from. Mm, right. And, and people have been trying to determine if there was any validity to the legend at all. And, you know, as we've talked about on this show before, there, there is a a trickle of truth to a lot of legends. Either the person was real and the story was fictional um, or the, the, the person was fictional, but the story really happened. 
so, you know, there's always something there and people have tried and, and it's been speculated that, that mother Leeds was actually a woman named Deborah Leeds, who was married to a man named Jaffet Leeds. Now, both of these folks lived in the, in, uh, in the Leeds point. Uh, and in 1736, Jaffet named 12 children in his will. Mike. So, so what the, the devil child that gets zilch, you nope. know, come on. He left, that, man. He left. He ran off. Sounds like a bad idea. You know, <laughs> he might, yeah, they should, should leave him a goat or something. Right. Um, but, but maybe that's just, you know, kind of a, an interesting coincidence. Um, but there is another version of the legend, uh, that doesn't involve mother leads. Um, this one tells the story of a young girl from Leeds Point who fell in love with a British soldier during the American Revolution. Now, in 1778, the Battle of Chestnut Neck took place in southern New Jersey. And that meant there was a pretty good amount of disdain for the British in that area. So the girl and the soldier met in secret. And eventually, she became pregnant, which would have been viewed as treason. I mean, literally sleeping with the enemy here. Right. And the town supposedly cursed the girl and the child, leading to her giving birth to what would become the Jersey Devil. We've got really good legends. I mean, I mean, these are good stories. Mm-hmm. But it, I mean, honestly, is there any truth to there being this creature that, lives in the pine barrens i mean has anybody ever seen it oh yeah <laughs> a well, lot i was gonna of say people. no but <laughs> <laughs> a lot a lot of people have claimed over the last 200 years to have seen the jersey devil and the sightings they date back all the way to the 18th century okay in the early 1800s Joseph Bonaparte, yep, he's related to that Bonaparte, uh, and he was a former king of Spain. He saw the devil in the woods while he was hunting. In another sighting, a group of men chased the devil to the edge of the woods in Clayton, but they were afraid to follow it any further. Now, Commodore Stephen Decatur was testing cannonballs when he saw the Jersey devil fly above him. And he claimed he fired a cannonball and hit it, but the creature wasn't hurt and kept right on flying. I got a question about that. How do you test a cannonball? I mean, uh, like, very carefully. Boom. <laughs> boom. Boom. Oh, yep, yep. Those seem to work okay. Yeah. <laughs> now go go find them. We need those right. back. They're the, they're the working ones. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that would be my problem. Is how do you get them back once you do that? You know, that's right. You know, I can test must... fire them all day long, but test pick them up, I can't do. <laughs> no, I thought that was weird. Like test a cannonball, and the Jersey Devil has even been seen with a ghost. With a ghost, the ghost howling around with Casper. Yeah. The ghost of Captain Kidd. And Captain Kidd supposedly buried his treasure in Barnegat Bay, and he beheaded one of his crew so that that man's ghost would stay behind and protect it. And people have actually claimed to have seen this headless pirate with the Jersey Devil walking on the beach and through the marshland. I got a and question. They also, <laughs> okay, good. Hit me because you're going to love uh, this next thing. Uh, well, it, it's probably not the question you think I'm going to ask, but if you see a headless ghost, how do you know who the hell it is? <laughs> I haven't thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> you just yes. see this a pirate, you know, with no head, and you're like, well, that could be one of 300 pirates. <laughs> I don't know. He needs, a, he needs to be wearing a shirt with a Wikipedia link to his story. See, oh. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know the story, he's just another headless ghost wandering around 
with this baby T-Rex with wings. Exactly. <laughs> but, but believe me, We got some right, fan art going right there. I'm telling you, we have given y'all so much fodder <laughs> to just overwhelm us with the pictures. <laughs> and so here's another. People have reported seeing the, seeing the Jersey Devil swimming with a mermaid. No, of course. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, it kind of looks like a seahorse, you know. <laughs> Didn't necessarily right. say she was riding it, but, you know. Well, well that would be more know? fun. I mean, <laughs> but in all seriousness, th- those are fun and, and they, they date way back. Um, but we're going to kind of we're going to kind of creep closer to the modern time. You're going to be surprised how many people have taken the time to report that they have seen the Jersey Devil. Now, the, the Jersey Devil, or as Adam mentioned before, the Leeds Devil, which is pretty much what it was known as up until the early 1900s. But there was an event in the early 1900s that kicked off this frenzy of Jersey Devil activity. Now, it's January 23rd, 1909. Now, early Sunday morning, people in Burlington started to see the Jersey Devil on the streets and flying through the air. And reports quickly spread of townspeople, farmers, and even policemen seeing a creature that resembled the devil himself. And of course, panic ensued. <laughs> You know, it's 1909, you know. Claims ranged from finding hoof marks in the snow and on trees to a full-on attack on a trolley car. Police claimed that they fired on the creature, but it suffered no damage. Now, schools shut down, so did some factories, and armed drivers accompanied trolley cars from Trenton to New Brunswick. And a group of men actually went out and, and had an expedition to, to hunt down and find the Jersey Devil. But they said their dogs were too scared to follow the hoof prints. Now, this went on for about a week. And, and at the end of the week, uh, the newspapers had written so many stories about the devil. And the people were so scared. But in time, the reports just kind of dwindled off and life started to return to normal again. But since that time, reports of the Jersey Devil are pretty regular, with many residents that live near the Pine Barrens holding on to the fact that this creature does actually exist. Now, the, the Jersey Devil fad died out for a little while after this until about 1925 when a farmer claimed that he saw an animal that he could not identify trying to get to his chickens. Now, the farmer claimed that he grabbed his rifle and killed the beast, then took photos of the corpse, but no one who saw the photo could identify the animal. In 1927, a taxi driver in Salem City allegedly encountered the Jersey Devil while changing a tire. The man told the police that a winged creature was pounding on the roof of the cab. So it was either the Jersey Devil or a guy wearing a Batman costume. <laughs> right. And he was mad that his fare was too high. <laughs> um, in 1960, residents of May's Landing reported hearing horrifying screams in the night. There was no explanation for the noises and people began to panic. Police actually hung flyers around town assuring residents that the Jersey Devil was a hoax. But the panic was perpetuated by a local circus owner who countered the police's appeal by offering a $100,000 reward for anybody who could capture the creature. Now, no one ever claimed the reward. 
a hundred thousand dollars in nineteen sixty. That is a truckload of money. That's yeah, that's a lot of money. I mean, so you can only imagine what people were out trying to find. Or, no joke. Or gluing together in their basement to go, hey, we got one. Now, one Mary Reitzer Christensen told Weird New Jersey that she got the, I love this, the quote, heebie-jeebies hmm. <laughs> one night in 1972 when she claims to have spotted the Jersey Devil on Green Tree Road. Now, Christensen was driving from Blackwood to Glassboro when she says she saw a towering figure crossing the road about 25 feet behind her car. She described the figure as standing taller than the average man with thick haunches like a goat and a huge woolly head. Now, here we are with a different description again. And and even even the legend says fur and feathers. Which is it? I don't I don't know of any animals that have both. No. Um and, and so here she says obviously it had a woolly head. Um but again the 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 hooven the hooven hooven is hooven a word um the hooves um with haunches like a goat as she describes now that's consistent that's mm-hmm. one thing that we keep hearing and that uh that's right around the time um a buddy of mine that i used to work with he was a kid living in that area and he told me this story several years ago um when he found out um, that I co-host Graveyard Tales. He's like, oh, I got a, I got a story for you. You'll like, <laughs> and um, we get that a lot. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, and I enjoy every one of them too. Um, but I, I think I mentioned this the last time we talked about the Jersey Devil. But he was a kid. He was in his room at night, and he was trying to go to sleep, and he heard this thum 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 on his bedroom window and he's on the second floor so he looks over at the window and there you know he gets up kind of to the window he didn't see anything at first and then he gets closer to it and as he gets right up against the window he sees a head pop up into the window with him and it's apparently the jersey devil head so he's face to face with only a glass pane in between them with the jersey devil holy crap and he said it it had reddish eyes. It wasn't glowing. They weren't glowing red, but they were red. And he screamed bloody murder and jumps back against the headboard of his bed and throws the covers over him. And well, his mom comes running in and she's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he tells her that he just saw the Jersey Devil outside of his window. And she walks up to the window and she beats on the window a few times and she goes, you get out of here. You leave my son alone. Get out of here. And he said, apparently, you know, either that did it or it just decided never to come back again because he never saw the thing again. But he was like nine or 10 years old when that happened. And it it was right outside of his window. Oh, God, that's an awesome story. I know. I love that one. That's why I've remembered it in detail to this day. (laughs) How awesome. Yeah, you you know, that's one thing that we we everybody has a ghost story and and we we love hearing everybody's ghost stories. Don't get us wrong. But very rarely do we come across somebody that we we know personally mm-hmm. that has a real cryptid story. Right. I mean that that's really come across some strange creature. Yeah, you know, mo- most of them. When when Adam and I get these kind of stories, when we meet people face to face, we get these stories that, well, my cousin, or a, a friend of mine, or this guy I knew, they're they're always third, fourth, fifth hand stories. Mm-hmm. But uh, rarely do we get a first hand account of a cryptid told directly to us. And, and I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah. The, the coolest thing about that was when I'm sitting there talking to him, I'm able to like read the conviction in his voice and on his oh, face. Yeah. He, yeah. no matter what he saw, no matter what it was, he was convinced 
that that was the Jersey Devil. And he he is absolutely convinced to this day he's in, you know, he's an older gentleman now. And he, many decades have passed since that time, and he remembers it like it was yesterday. Man, that's, man, that is awesome. I love it. I love it. Now, one thing that the Pine Barrens probably has a lot of would be Pines. For, Pines. That's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> and and my guess is they probably also have a lot of forest rangers. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we've talked about forest rangers on this show many times. And, you know, people that have some level of authority and accountability, when they share a story, it, it kind of makes my ears perk up because I'm like, you know, if you hear some some schmo come wandering out of the woods and, and he's got some tail of some creature he saw in there, you, you want to believe it, mm-hmm. but you always kind of look at him kind of like, yeah, you know, did were you, were you hunting wild turkey today? Yeah, right. <laughs> but, you know, for forest rangers, it's different because they have a, a really good grasp on all the creatures that live in the area that they, you know, they monitor. Yeah. You know, they, they know what to expect. They know what not to expect. So when they come across something that they can't identify, it's a, it's out of the ordinary for sure. Now in 1980, Wharton state forest chief ranger, Alan McFarlane saw something that, not only kind of spooked him, but it it grossed him out and it really pushed the boundaries of his wild animal knowledge. Uh, McFarland found a brutal scene on a South Jersey farm where a pack of pigs had been killed. Now, McFarland says that the backs of their heads were eaten and their bodies were scratched and torn. But he says there were no tracks surrounding the bodies and there was no blood on the ground. Now, this this kind of sounds like chupacabra kind of stuff. Yeah, it but, does. But of course, being a forest ranger, especially the chief ranger, he would be able to assess a scene like this and say, this looks like whatever animal attack. Sure. You know, this looks like a coyote. This looks like a fox. This looks like a bear you know, whatever, you know, he would have a really good grasp of what an attack on another animal by that particular animal would present like, and this one presented like nothing he had ever seen. So, you know, it, it, and, and like I said, it was pretty gross. So, <laughs> yep, and, you know, sounds it, like it. it sounds gross with just the description I read. Um, so, yeah, I always take those kind of stories and I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. Um, in 88, 1988, an Asbury Park press reporter told the story of a Howell Township resident who claimed to encountered the Jersey Devil just seven years before. Now, this guy, he, he describes it all the way down to the size of his teeth. So... He must have been able to get a really good look at this thing. He was close, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the the wings, the hooves, um, you know, bipedal creature, you know, horse to dog shaped head. And and like I said, even down to the the large teeth that it had. So, you know, either he's got a really vivid imagination or he saw something, Mm -hmm. um, you know, well enough that he could describe it. Um, also in the late eighties, a group of friends went camping and riding dirt bikes in the pine barrens. Now, while riding down a trail about a hundred yards from their camp, all of the motorbikes stalled. Now one said it could have, it could have had to do with the terrain or the nearby power plant. Uh, Okay. I don't know why. But yeah, I don't know what the power plant would have to do with it. <laughs> it's like, unless you live in Springfield. Yeah, um, right. So uh, he said, as suddenly as the bikes quit running, 
the guys heard a piercing, inhuman scream coming from the woods. Now, when they finally made it back to camp, those who stayed behind said they could also hear the screams. And that night, one of the men went into a local bar and he told the bartender about the screams they had heard in the woods. And the bartender told this guy that he had had an encounter with the Jersey devil. And, and the screams are another thing They're They're not always present, but, um, but you hear a commonality that, you know, the, the, the screams, I mean, there's a difference between a growl or a howl Mm -hmm. and a scream. You know, most people would recognize a scream, um, you know, so that's that's normally what you'll hear described if you hear any kind of sound along with an account at all. But um, moving on to 1993, another forest ranger. This was uh, Ranger John Irwin. And Irwin says he was driving along the Malika River when he saw a strange creature blocking the road in front of him. He said it was about six feet tall with horns and matted black fur. The two stared at one another for several minutes before the creature turned and ran into the forest. Another guy that, you know, you would think he would have known what it was. Uh, And here's, here's another one. One evening while taking out the trash, a friend Coppolo, owner of the Smithville Inn and Village in Galloway Township, reportedly saw a strange shadow projected on the wall before her. She said she looked up and saw the shadow of a beast with wings. Now, this had to have been pretty terrifying, but Coppolo said that she actually felt calm, that she felt like the Jersey devil was watching over her, like, you know, protecting her business. I'm kind of like, I don't know what the world would give you that idea. But yeah, <laughs> there's there's not there there's no there's no legend that this is like uh, you know the the Lorax of the Pine Barrens. You know he's <laughs> out there speaking for the trees. You know, <laughs> you know all the other stories like this thing's pretty dang up scary, right? <laughs> and so she's like, you know, oh, it's like a it's a fairy of the pine forest. I, I'm not so sure about that. I don't gather that from what we've heard previously. <laughs> this is another account uh, where the Jersey devil was found uh, on the road while traveling on route nine in Bayville. Three cars were forced to slam on their brakes when, according to one of the witnesses, a 10 foot tall Jersey devil figure with a long head and short, flat ears ran across the road. Now, one of the witnesses reported that the creature emerged from a wooded area near a mini mall and galloped out in front of traffic, disappearing into the woods on the other side of the street. So they're not afraid of people. Well, it was shopping. That's another thing that we'll touch on uh, here in a little bit is uh, I said they. I mean, we're we're talking about a, a... a span of time that either there's one of these things that is somehow supernatural and has lived for, you know, two, 300 years, or there were multiples of them so that they could reproduce. Right. So it's just something to keep, it's just something to keep in mind. Um, now one of the most recent sightings uh, of a Jersey devil occurred in the Galloway township, in October of 2015. That's only five years ago, folks. Very recent. And this one's pretty famous. Little Egg Harbor resident David Black said he was driving along Route 9. Man, they love Route 9. Mm-hmm. He was near a golf course when he saw what he thought was a llama walking in and out of the tree line on the side of the road. Got a lot of llamas out there in the Pine Barrens. Well, you know, I mean, you know, llamas are used, you know, for wool and whatnot. I mean, there's a llama farm, you know, within, you know, 15 miles of my house. Right. Um, So it's not unheard of if, if one of them got out and it was just kind of wandering around, figuring out what it needed to do. Um, 
but he said suddenly the creature spread its wings and flew away, which is really not behavior you expect out of a llama. No, not seeing a llama do that. (laughs) So moving quickly, Black was able to capture the beast's image with his cell phone, and that photo went viral. Now, you guys, I have seen this photo, and, and I have looked at it many, many times. And honestly, it looks like a stuffed unicorn toy that's been painted black and either thrown in the air while the photo was taken or suspended on fishing line or something that wouldn't mm-hmm. show up in a picture. Um, it, it, is, it, is an odd, it is an odd photo. It, it, a lot of people have referred to this photo going, this is photographic evidence of the existence of the Jersey Devil. And, well, you go look at it and you, you tell me. I wouldn't want that to be the photographic evidence that we pointed people to. Yeah, so so you go look at that picture, and then you come back to me, and you tell me that it's photographic evidence of a Jersey Devil. Yeah, right. And and I'm going to tell you how you're wrong. Right. <laughs> it looks like a poodle with wings, you know, <laughs> which wouldn't that be cool? You know, yep. the winged poodle of the Pine Barrens. You know, it's, that's got a good ring to it. I like that. I'd go see that, too. <laughs> That would bring just as many tourists as the Jersey Devil would. Why don't they just switch it? But if you look at that photo, you'll see what I'm talking about. And I think if when you go look at it, you'll realize that you've already seen it. But curiously enough, a few days after David Black took this photograph, Emily Martin shot a video of what appears to be the same creature after she spotted it on Old Port Republic Road near Leeds Point. Now, both Black and Martin swear that neither of the images nor the video were edited or set up. Now, I've watched this video, and I'll tell you, it's really quiet, but when you see this thing fly across the camera, you don't hear it make any sound. Now, it looks staged, In my opinion, this is just my opinion, for this reason. When you see the quote-unquote devil, you hear this little gasp like the person was shocked. But the gasp gasp sounds like what you make when you find like a really pretty rock. (laughs) Or Or when someone tells you something you really have no interest in. You know, like when one of my kids show me a video from a YouTuber that just dropped this bomb, like the store was sold out of their eyeliner or something. You know, it's yeah. like, oh, that's oh, it. no. Oh, no. If I saw the Jersey Devil, wouldn't be the sound that I would make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And, and the other thing is so weird is that it seems so small. I mean, it it does have some wing flappage, which makes it a little bit better than David Black's photo. Um, but they're they're videoing the night sky. Flappage no- ain't everything, though, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I keep. That's what I keep hearing. But, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, they're they're videoing the night sky with no real good reason. You know, you just you kind of look. The video is real short. You just kind of looking, sky's kind of purpley. You can tell it's just after sunset. You can see the trees, and then all of a sudden you hear the, and then, and you're kind of like, yeah. what, the, what the hell was that? Yeah. It, it almost looks like a bug that got a little too close to their camera lens, but they wouldn't have noticed that, or, or maybe a bat, because it does have yeah, wings, it and it is flapping. Yeah. Um. And, you know, that's, that's how I always tell if it's, you know, it's around dusk and I, and I see something flying. I, I, that's what I've taught the kids. It's not a bird. Birds don't fly like that. And they right. don't typically fly at night. Right. You know, not, not, not regular birds. And like, you know, if you see this thing and its wings are just going 90 miles an hour, it's a bat. Right. And so well, they know, oh, well, that, that's bats. You know, that's not a bunch of birds around that street light. It's a bunch of bats. Yeah. When you bring up a good point that um, 
they seem to be filming the night sky for no reason. Yeah. That always gets me when we're talking about photographic evidence of something. And you'll see these, this is, this is happening to this man in his bedroom at night. And check this out. Why was dude filming himself sleeping? Why is it so light in the room? You know, and do you sleep with the lights on and a video camera rolling all the time? Or why was the video even recording that night unless right. you were planning on doing something? And it's the same way with this. It, why are you filming nothing in the sky? You know, they, it's not like, oh, hey, look, we're filming this cool helicopter that's coming down at night. And you can see, you know, we, we haven't seen this before, so we, we want to get a video of it. And then all of a sudden, this thing jumps in frame. That's the only thing in the frame. You got nothing else happening. So exactly. it, it confuses me when when you do that, when there's a, a recording of something that you wouldn't normally record and people don't even think about it. Why are you yeah. recording yourself sleeping? You yeah. know, I, I, I just don't understand. At least with a photograph, you can say, I saw something or I heard something. And I wanted to to try to capture it or, I, you know, I, I pulled out my phone and I tried to take this picture. And look, when we get when we read these stories and we hear people, well, I saw this and it was this and this was going on and it looked like that. But I couldn't get a clear picture or I, I couldn't get my camera out fast enough. Look, I get it. I, I don't think that's necessarily a cop out. I think it right. might be in a lot of cases, but I don't think it's a cop out because hell, I've tried to take a picture of my kid doing something mm -hmm. and thought, Oh, 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 and went to grab my phone. And by the time I got the phone out, the camera at unlocked the camera app up and I'm ready to shoot a picture. It's over, mm -hmm. you know, or I get the very tail end of it. I'm like, eh. So I, I get it. it it's it, everybody says, oh, well, wow, we hadn't seen pictures of Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster or the Jersey Devil, you know, and everybody's walking around with a an HD video camera in their pocket or, you know, a, 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 you know, a 20 megapixel camera right at the, you know, that they're constantly. I'm, I, OK, OK, OK. I get it. We all have cameras. We all have ways to get these images, but it just doesn't work out that way. Right. But with video, there's just something about it that if there's no context with the video that would explain why you were taking a video, I'm right with Adam on this. I mean, if, if you can't, if you can't at least, at least tell me why you were videoing or have some context in the video itself then I'm going to immediately think that it's staged. Sure. That absolutely. we started recording, we did our little spiel, and then we stopped it. Because what we were doing right before we hit record was setting up whatever it was we were fixing to do. Yep. It, I'm like, you know, okay, you know, whatever. But you can look at this video too, and I, I feel the same about this video as I do the photograph. I'm like, it just... It just doesn't hold water. You know, I, I, I'm more apt to believe the park ranger stories than I am to believe what people have considered to be photographic evidence. And, you know, it's not like that, you know, the whole world is going, this is the photo, you know, that we have. <laughs> They're not, you know, the majority of people are going this. They, they share my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just it's 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 funny. You know, it's funny when you watch the video. And when you look at that picture, man, I'm telling you, you're just like, what? <laughs> but there is a Pine Barren uh, resident who has had multiple encounters um, with the Jersey Devil. And he's even written a book. Paul Pedersen is the author of the book Legendary Pine Barrens, as well as the writer of many songs about that region. Now, he claims that not only does he believe that a creature exists, that he has seen it. Now, in the documentary Looking for a Legend, Pedersen relays a story from when he was a fireman in Lakeland. 
Now, when two ladies were riding horses near the fire station, the firemen heard a commotion outside. They went outside to find that the two ladies had been thrown from their horses. When they asked what happened, both ladies said the horses had been frightened by a creature that came out of the woods. The ladies said it was the Jersey Devil. So this encounter is actually documented, according to Pedersen, in the records of the Lakeland Fire Station. So there's, nice. you know, there's an official record that there was a Jersey Devil attack, you know, right there at the fire station. But Paul also tells about a time when he was babysitting his sister and he heard something rattling around in his cellar. Uh, he claims that his stepson was chased up the street by something. And, and then Pedersen says, while riding with his publisher, they both saw something cross the street in front of the car. And neither man knew what it was. And he says, the publisher really won't discuss it. So <laughs> it was something that kind of <laughs> kind of spooked them both, but it really freaked out his publisher. So, hey, I'm not talking about that. Let's not yeah. bring that up anymore. <laughs> now, uh, now, Arth- uh, Arthur. Arthur. Author Bill Sprouse is a descendant of Mother Leeds. Nice. Now, he says that his grandmother was a Leeds from Leesport and would tell them that they were related to the Jersey Devil. Now, I mean, you know, most people hear stories when they're growing up that, you know, their grandmother says, now, you're related to Abraham Lincoln or you're related to Mm -hmm. Billy the Kid, you know. Wouldn't it suck to have your grandmother tell you stories? Now, you're related to the Jersey Devil. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, My mom, that sounds like what my mom does to me. My mom will, uh, my mom rescued this goat when it was like newborn and its mother rejected it. So my mom tells me that this goat is my brother all the time. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, I guess, mom, thanks. But the Jersey Devil being related to it would be worse, I think. Yeah. Adam's writing a book called My Brother the Goat. <laughs> yeah. We share uh, our goatees looks very similar, but that's the only <laughs> resemblance I see. So, you know, what what could this be if there's if there's anything there at all? I mean, obviously, you just heard I, I just rattled off about, I don't know, 13 or 14 different encounters where people mm-hmm. reported having seen something and they all have a gut feeling that what they saw was indeed the Jersey devil. So, you know, if it was wow, but if it wasn't, then what was it? But because the descriptions of this creature really don't fit anything that you would think of, that would be mistaken. Right. I mean, I don't, I don't know of any, any animals quite like this or that you could see in a, in an instant and think that's the Jersey devil. And it really be something else, you know, just, just going based on the descriptions. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I don't, I, I, there are theories There are explanations that people have that say, oh, well, you saw this and just mistook it for the Jersey Devil. But we can get into those and and I don't see it. It, I mean, I, I don't I don't believe that anybody who lives around the Pine Barrens that knows what's in the Pine Barrens would see an everyday creature that they would see all the time like oh yeah i I saw a raccoon last night but i really thought it looked like the jersey devil or Mm -hmm. you know i mean one of the explanations that dates back to you know the 1909 sightings was that this was an elaborate hoax that was designed to actually lower real estate prices in that area so that people could afford the houses in that area and apparently investigator Ivan T. Sanderson claimed that he discovered the fake feet that were used to make the footprints in the early 1900 sightings Mm. but 
if if that's the case, where where were the ones before that and up until recently? What what happened? Are they just seeing nothing? They're seeing a hoax from the early 1900s. Yeah, I'm, and the fact that they're hooves. I mean, there's, I mean, we talked about the horses, you know, there, but there's, there's deer yep. in that area and, you know, they have, they have hooves as well. And if you're looking at a hoof print, I mean, you, you can look at this two ways. You can say, oh, we saw these, we, we heard reports of this creature. Um, we heard screams and we found hoof prints. Well, okay. So. Maybe you just got excited and you saw some deer hoof prints or you saw where somebody had been maybe, um, you know, horseback riding, you know, through the area and you just got a little overexcited. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really see why there would be any reason for someone to make a fake one. Right. I mean, it'd be pretty easy to reproduce hoof prints. Yeah. You know, just ride your horse around out there or just find some, you know, I'm yeah. sure they're out there. And, oh yeah. And instead of having to go and fabricate something that would apparently seem common, um, you know, it's not like a big footprint, uh, or anything like that where, you know, we're talking about something that doesn't exist in nature that we know of. So it just seems a little weird. I, 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 I do at times tend to think that this is more of a hoax or at least a lot of the stories are hoaxes mm. or just people looking for attention. Or like I said, people just got a little excited and having heard the legend for probably all of their life, um, just immediately make this assumption that they had witnessed the Jersey devil. Right. And but convince I, I, themselves that they do. Yeah, but I don't know that that all of them were, especially like these the the forest ranger stories where they're finding animals that have been attacked and killed in such a manner that it doesn't fit with the wildlife that's around there. Um, you know, I I did I did see an interview with a with a gentleman who said that. He did not he did not claim to have seen the Jersey Devil. What he was saying is that and everybody's going to hate this, but that he had actually seen an owl with a 6-foot wingspan. Now that's Why not, has it got to be an owl? I know, but that's not uncommon, you know, for an owl to be that size. Um but you know, it, an uh, an owl I I just I don't know if that explains a pig attack in that. I mean, wh one owl for sure didn't kill a pack of pigs. Right. You know, at, and doesn't explain the hooves or the horns or the, right. the horse head. Yeah, definitely not the horse head. You know, some owls have feathers that give the appearance of horns. I can buy that, but I don't know of an owl that has a long face. Right. Most owls have a flat face, or at least all the ones that I know of. If you know of a hor the horse head owl, there is that picture that gets circulated of that. Um, what is it? That is it a is it a bat? Some big giant bat that's got kind of a horse shaped head. The flying fox. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Okay. You know there is that thing. Now it doesn't have hooves. Um, yeah, and it's not native to the Pine Barrens either. Well, this is true, you know. So, you know, I mean, at least we know of some creature that exists in nature that fits a little bit closer. But then then we have to get into the discussion of, well, how the heck did it get there? Yeah, right. <laughs> and live, a uh, population of them live for hundreds of years where we don't know that they now live there. Right, where the forest um, rangers wouldn't know. Hey, right. we have this really unique animal that lives here in the Pine Barrens. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got another one that everybody's going to hate, like the owl, um, because I hate this explanation as well, is they're calling it the stray sandhill crane hypothesis. They say because it's tall 
and kind of weird looking that people would say, well, it's a sandhill crane. But the problem is the sandhill crane does not winter in the Pine Barrens anymore. So it couldn't be them. Yeah, it goes um, to the so, Hamptons like everybody else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so others will say that, oh, well, it's a great blue heron because they're about the same size and they do live in the area. But again, if you live around there, you're going to know what a blue heron looks like. Um, there's blue heron in Tennessee. You've seen them. There's blue heron here in Texas. I've seen them. They don't look like a horse-faced, cloven-hooved thing to me. Um, the other thing is, if you're seeing these things flying at night, most herons don't fly at night. And so, they kind of glide. Yeah. You know, if you've ever seen a heron or a crane fly... They, they glide more than they flap. They do flap. Don't get me wrong. Don't send me an email. Tell me, you know, herons flap. I, I get they flap, but they glide too. And the, the flight descriptions that, you know, some of these experiences have, it's more bat like, like we were talking about. It's more, a, more of a flappy flappy than a glidey glidey. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Another thing that people talk about is, you know, the, the, the calls at night and this one, it bothers me because they've got so many different, just random explanations for these calls at night. And I get it. You can't verify at night what is making the noise. They said these nocturnal calls could either be from a red fox, an eastern screech owl, a long eared owl or from ice breaking in the river. What? Wait, yeah. ice breaking? Ice breaking in the river. Sounds like a scream. So, apparently so. Oh, but, no, I know what it is. It's the ice breaking and somebody falling into the river that's screaming. Right. <laughs> that's right. it's what the they person, mean by that. <laughs> it's the person falling into the frozen uh, river there that's screaming. But, I mean, I get it that a fox could potentially sound like uh -huh. a scream. I yeah. do. I, I get that. Yeah. But, you know, mo most of the sightings aren't accompanied by a sound. It's just a, or not accompanied by a scream. You know, they're, they're just a sighting. Yeah. And this screech, to me, I wouldn't hear that and go immediately, oh, that's the Jersey Devil screaming. I would right. say that's a weird sound out there in the forest, but oh, don't yeah. know what it is. Yeah, and there's there's a lot there's a lot of birds of prey that call the Pine Barrens home. I mean, bald eagles for one, but red tail hawks and peregrine falcons, you know, along with the screech owls, um, all are native to the Pine Barrens. So mm -hmm. all of those all of those birds can can make a screech that at a distance could be mistaken for more of a scream um right but, you know we've even talked about that you know peacocks sound i mean they sound more like somebody screaming than any animal cry i've heard um but you know i i don't know that the scream is so directly associated with the sightings like adam said you know it's like they we either got a sighting or we heard the screams um you know, on occasion, they have happened together, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, a Jersey Devil creature would be the one making the sound. I mean, what if the Jersey Devil come into town and all of a sudden the birds are like, ah, holy shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> what is that? That could be it. <laughs> you know, so the birds go nuts because here's this, you know, this baby T-Rex flying around. And <laughs> yeah. And so they, uh, you know, they, they freak out. Um, I don't know. And, you know, Adam and I aren't trying to debunk this at all. Um, in fact, I would I would love to find out that this thing was legitimate, that there, there really was a creature, whether it, it exists now or it existed at some time. Um, I, I would I would love to know that for sure. You know, I, I would rather I would rather that be the case than to continue to listen to. Well, it's an owl or it's ice breaking mm -hmm. or any, anything like that. 
Um, but uh, but the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum in Atlantic City has a skeleton of a uh, of a Jersey Devil. In fact, right before we came out, I, I I sent Adam a link where he could he could order him one. <laughs> And that may happen. <laughs> you know, order a 3D printed skeleton of a Jersey Devil. So, uh, so I'm not, you know, you, you, you go into the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum for entertainment. You, know? mm-hmm. you, you can't take everything in there as fact. And I don't necessarily know that they present it as such. I just know that there's one there. So, right. Um, so the last, uh, Last couple explanations here that people have tried to give for the Jersey Devil are fun, and we can go through these fairly quickly. Um, One is a surviving pterosaur, Um, and we've talked about that before from other episodes, is that, you know, could there have been a relic population of flying dinosaur left in the early 1900s, late 1800s, and people saw them. Well, maybe. Or maybe they saw the the skeletons and, you know, the fossils and thought, oh, well, this Jersey Devil, you know. Exactly. Like some have theorized. Now, now we've, we've discussed the, the theory for this uh, with other cryptids, and understandably so the likelihood of a a prehistoric creature in that form surviving mm-hmm. for that long i mean we know and i know from just from listening to life's little mysteries about dinosaurs that these pterosaurs were essentially the ancestors of modern day birds so they they have survived in some way, but they evolved to look like they do now. They didn't stay the same. And it's 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 really tough to wrap your head around the idea that um a creature that you know lived however many million years ago during the Cretaceous period or the Jurassic period managed to continue to live unchanged for that amount of time, much, much less undiscovered, just unchanged. And, right. and that would be what people have seen. Um, we talked about this with the Thunderbirds. Yep. Um, exactly. You know, is it, is it even reasonable to think that you know a pterosaur um, could could still be around and be flying, and this is what people see. I I don't know. I mean, you know, could it could it be a species that has evolved much more slowly? Sure. I mean, I suppose I'm I'm not a paleontologist. You know, uh, I'm I'm not really an ologist of any type. Um, but I, you know, I'd like to think, yeah, maybe that's, that's happened. But the idea that a, that a prehistoric animal has survived for thousands or millions of years, um, with very, very little adaptation, I just, I can't, I I can't see it, but I I tell you this, I, I do believe that there are a lot of people in the Pine Barrens that have seen something that they are convinced is the Jersey devil or, or at, at minimum, they are convinced that it's something they've, they've never seen before. Um, and, and that, that in and of itself is enough of a curiosity to, to make the story of the Jersey devil fascinating, you know? Right. Now the last, um, explanation that I've got, I just want to touch on because if we didn't, Somebody would say, well, I've heard that, and so I need to put this out there, is some people say that it was a possible kangaroo that people were seeing because of the long <laughs> legs, yeah, the tail, and the short arms. But during that time, 
there were no reports of any escaped ruse in that area. And if it was escaped from a zoo or a private collection, somebody would have said something that, hey, my kangaroo escaped. Can y'all, you know, help me look for it or something <laughs> like that? And they never did, you know. Look, if somebody approaches me and says, hey, my kangaroo escaped, you know, in Tennessee, I'm going to be like, what? Yeah. No, look, mister, I'm not getting in your car. Don't tell me how many ruse you had escape. I'm not helping you look for it. I'm not yeah. getting in your car. So, I, you know, I've always been curious because I've, I've been told a lot of things. And we have a lot of Aussie listeners. You know, we're, we're, we're big in Australia. <laughs> I, just, I just, I'm curious that, because I've always heard this, that, that kangaroos are like giant rabbits. And meaning that, you know, they're essentially, you know, big rodents and they, they reproduce like wildfire and they're everywhere and they're much more of a nuisance than they are anything else. Um, and I've just always been curious, is that, is that accurate? And, and, and what have, what I've been told all this time, is that right? I'd, I'd just like to know, do y'all. Y'all just like, we love kangaroos, or like, get these dead gum kangaroos out of here. <laughs> yeah. So if you're in Australia, uh, hit Matt up on Facebook and let him know, either yeah. crush his hopes or <laughs> or validate his hopes. Yeah. You know, show me show me a picture of you with what are the leash. You know, that's what I yeah, want right? to know. Yeah. <laughs> You know, or do you like see a kangaroo and you cross the street and walk on the other side? <laughs> <laughs> so we've reached the point in our episode here where we ask you guys, like we have from the very beginning, what do you guys think? Do you guys think that the Jersey Devil is legitimately out there and is a cryptozoological find waiting to be discovered? Do you think it was a hoax that has been perpetuated and now people just mistake seeing something else for the Jersey Devil? Or have you yourself seen the Jersey Devil? Um, let us know if you live in that area or if you visited that area. Hit us up on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and let us know. Yeah. And while you're doing that, be sure to click over and check our website. It's graveyardpodcast.com where you can find links to buy Graveyard Tales merchandise, everything from coffee mugs to baby onesies. Um, but you can also uh, listen to the show, and you can become a patron. And Adam and I have uh, have just dropped a few more pa patron uh, Patreon episodes. So uh, if you're interested in, in how we do those shows, because they're a good bit different than these shows, um, Go over there and uh, show your support for the show and pick up some bonus content. Uh, we really do appreciate it, and it does help us keep this show moving and not uh, one big long advertisement, things like that. Right. Um, be sure and go and check out our sponsor, Every Plate, uh, and thank you to them. Uh, we we actually we, we couldn't do this show without the support of our sponsors and the support of you. So. Until next time, we'll save you a seat in the graveyard. See you soon. The dogs are attacking the door. They know I'm in here. Ah, uh, okay. We've had more dog problems tonight than... I know. First mine, then yours.